Overtime was created by Matt Holman, founder of the EMW Foundation, and is made possible by the Prodigy Media Group and RPM Athlete Performance. With inspirational credit to my friend, Dr. Fred Obi. Welcome to Overtime, an open conversation series on racism in the sport of lacrosse. We hope you find this thought provoking, educational, and it leaves you better prepared as a member of the lacrosse community. Thanks again for joining us. And now for this week's panel. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, Overtime Chat. This is episode seven. Uh, I called it the scholars because we have a lot of uh, scholarly people on the panel. And I'm going to start with the ladies, introducing them. And I'll start with Coach Amy Slade. Hi, Amy, how are you? Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Excuse me. Amy is a product of New York. She uh, was born with a stick in her hand <laughs> in Garden City. Uh, her love and talent for the game took her to the, University, to the University of Virginia, where she earned her degree in English. She is currently the head coach of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County uh, women's team, proud mother of two. And you have a unique situation, three. Yeah, my little guy just turned one. <laughs> That's right, I saw the birthday picture. I, uh, I'm getting confused. Why? It's because Harry Alford just had a second child, which we need to congratulate on two weeks ago. Um, and you also, your husband is also a football coach, NCAA football coach? No, he played football at Richmond. Oh, played football. Okay, my bad. My bad. Sorry. Um, next, we have Christina Snell. Hi, Christina. Hi. Another New York City, born, born in New York City, raised in northern New Jersey. Um, she holds her undergrad, her undergrad degree in art education from King College, a master's in education with emphasis on cross-cultural education from National University. And I believe it's a degree or certificate program in art and the creative process from UC San Diego. Um, yeah. Okay, got that right, good. She's currently an art teacher at a California Title I elementary school. And I'm gonna have you explain what Title I elementary school means in a few minutes. But they serve a large population of immigrant and refugee families. And she was lucky enough to be exposed to lacrosse at age 18 when she moved to San Diego and she, quote, was in complete submersion <laughs> across your ex-husband. I don't know who that guy is, but he sure is a great guy. Um, <laughs> next, we have Dr. Tina Opie, Tina, the better half of the Opie twins down there. Uh, a product of Alexandria, Virginia, Dr. Tina was introduced to lacrosse in the 90s when she started dating the love of her life, Fred. Well, Fred wrote that. Tina Fred wrote that, I swear. <laughs> No, it's true. I mean, I knew it was a sport, but I had never met anyone who played it. Definitely not any black people who played it. That's why we're having the conversation. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Dr. Opie is an associate professor of management at Babson College and a visiting associate professor at MIT's Sloan School of Management, an award-winning researcher and teacher. She explores the connections between diversity, inclusion, and equity along with identity, culture, culture, fashion, authentic, authenticity, and professionalism. She's the proud mother of two youth lacrosse players, a daughter and a son. Um, and then on to the guys, we welcome back Trevor Tierney. Trevor, how are you? Good to see you again. Trevor was on episode one, for those of you who might not have caught that. He's a psychology graduate of Princeton University, earned his master's in psychology through Harvard Extension. Trevor has won at all levels, NCAA, Team USA, and currently serves as the VP of LXTC Lacrosse in Denver. And they operate travel teams in the University of Denver lacrosse camps and clinics. Um, next, we have Kevin Kelly. Kevin. Kevin grew up in Needham, Mass, just outside of Boston. He gained interest in lacrosse in middle school when watching his older brother play in high school. Uh, he played and graduated from Providence College. He then moved west and earned his master's in organization and leadership in urban education from the University of San Francisco. Kevin is the founder of Oakland Lacrosse Club. Uh, 
The club uses the cross as a vehicle for leadership development, academic counseling, nutrition and education, and for the youth of Oakland, California public schools. Uh, they expose over 2,000 youth annually to the game and 175 players participate in a year-round program. So that is outstanding, Kevin, welcome. Uh, and who am I missing? Fred, sorry, <laughs> wasn't on purpose. Doc, Professor Fred Opie, there's so many doctors and professors here. Born and raised in Hudson Valley, specifically Croton on the Hudson. He wanted me to say that. Fred began playing lacrosse in eighth grade. He's a graduate of Herkimer Community College Syracuse, and Syracuse University with a degree in education. He earned his master's in history from Shippensburg University, and he has he earned his PhD in history from Syracuse. Excuse me. Um, Dr. Opie has enjoyed great success on the lacrosse field at all of his stops, including, including Team USA, Syracuse, and his most joy comes from coaching youth lacrosse for the last 20 years. He is also so lucky to have been my roommate for a short time at Syracuse. So I know, Fred, I know, hold, hold yourself together. So I welcome all of you <laughs> and um, appreciate you taking the time. So thank you for that. If you're getting feedback from me, I will mute myself. But let me just start by posing a topic of discussion, I'll call it. I'm going to read this off. Um, it was during our college conversation, the episode we had with college coaches, and a couple of players mentioned the isolation that they felt being, on the, being one of a few players of color at a tournament. I think a lot of people talk about growing the game and increasing diversity. The question is, how do, we, how do we both increase diversity racially and economically? Uh, and that's just an open question to you as the panel. Can I go first? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's funny because I've been having a really great conversation with uh, my best friend in the entire wide world, Jesse Morgan, who played mm -hmm. with me at the University of Virginia. She coached at George Mason. She's now the athletic director at um, Garrison Forest here in Baltimore. Um, and so we've been talking about like, how do we create this environment of diversity in lacrosse and how do we grow it? Um, at UMBC, we're really um, connected to Harlem lacrosse um, in Baltimore and we do a lot of work with them. Um, my husband's on the board of Harlem and it's just an awesome organization, but how do we make sure that those kids stay interested and then continue to grow interested at the high school and then college level? Um, and one thing that, you know, Jesse had brought up to me was like no one wants to play Howard University and they have a team and no one wants to play them for what reason? Like I've heard, oh, I want to, I don't want to mess up my APR. I don't want to mess up this. I don't want to mess up that. Oh, we have to go there. Sometimes they don't have enough to feel, people to field the team. And I thought that is kind of like a no brainer for us. So what we're trying to do at UMBC is create and hopefully you know COVID doesn't interfere in a couple of months but create a a game where we play Howard like we Howard understands they get it like we all get it at some level if you want to be the best you have to play against people better than you you know like that is just how you grow the game that's how you grow yourselves as people and as athletes so I think you know just what Jesse was saying to me is like they just need to get games sometimes they don't even have enough games to put a schedule together and to me it's like you know, it's not about the winning and losing at that point. It's about elevating. And so I think it would be really great for us to play, you know, a Baltimore almost city school. We're right outside the city. Um, and then a lot of girls in the Baltimore Harlem um, lacrosse community get to actually come to like a place like U.S. Lacrosse, where I would love to host the game, where they watch girls who look exactly like them playing on this grand stage and if you guys have ever been to US lacrosse it's a pretty cool environment you get these good like vibes um and I could imagine that for a black girl to sit there and see other black girls playing and be like oh damn that could be me like playing at this high level um and knowing that it's attainable and it's not just something that you do in the middle school after school it's something that's serious it's something that can pay your education it's something that could you know introduce you to new majors or, or new realms of study that you never thought you might be interested in. Um, and so I think that is like one of my goals is to really try to get Howard. I know right now they they don't have a coach, but I've been trying to talk with the athletic director and Jesse's really been helping me to talk with their coach to open up this game 
to have a clinic before, a clinic after, autograph signings after. So these girls sitting in the stands are like, damn, like I could be wearing that uniform playing like in this grand stage. And I don't think of like any other greater way. Like, you know, I remember watching Georgetown play in their national championship at Hopkins. I was super young. It was the first like national championship my mom brought me to. I had to come down to Baltimore. I was like, I don't want to leave Long Island. Why am I going to Baltimore? But we go and we watch and I'm like, I want to be in a national championship. And my mind was set from that day forward. So could you imagine what that would do to a young black girl that's like, I want to be those kind, I want to be that girl playing on that stage. And so I just think that's a great environment to, to provide for them um, to look up to and be like, wow, this is really real and it's really attainable. And that's what I want. And so um, I think that's a way, I don't know if that's the answer, but I think that's a step in the right direction. So I don't know if anyone has like, Amy, you're totally off base or you're in the right direction help would be great. (laughs) I'm going to jump in. I think um, something I've been thinking about doing with my MCLA college teams, I I think if they were to, like anybody that comes to San Diego where I live, I could connect them with um, one of the underserved communities here and just, you know, set up the game at their home facility and do the same thing where where the kids, you know, the college guys come out and you get, get the youth kids to come out early. Uh, for that throw around part before they start really warming up. And then, you know, my suggestion is like to tell the coach, have a pizza party while the teams are warming up and then they stay and watch the game and and you have the kids interact with them after. Um, I think more teams would do that. They're just kind of probably don't know which way to go with it first. Um, And let me take a minute to just welcome back and, and introduce coach Chaz Woodson, uh, who joined us just getting off his, uh, uh, call with his team and coach congratulations on, on the new gig at Hampton that's awesome uh, and as I mentioned you, personally my mother attended Hampton and graduated there so that's pretty cool um, but Chad joins us again and then um, I think Harry just timed yep Harry's there uh, and I just want to remember to say uh, Harry welcome or congratulations uh, on the birth of your second child there that was thank you go that's pretty Thank cool you. that you're here right now. Congrats, man. Uh, I, I just put him to, to sleep. Yeah. There you go. So, <laughs> um, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, but yeah, let's keep, let's just keep going. But yeah, I think, um, and Kevin, you, you posed that question, I believe, but you have a good relationship with the Cal men's lacrosse team, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and and that's something I, – I, is Oakland close to Cal? You guys are close to each other or no? Yeah, uh, UC Berkeley is about 10 minutes away from, from the city of Oakland and about yeah. 20 minutes away from our hub over at Laney College. Um, and I think that partnership has been helpful in terms of just, you know, pure numbers of having both the men's and women's team volunteer with our program. And so when we're doing outreach and a PE classes, great to have just college athletes with you. I think – um, similar to what Amy said, as we've developed from a middle school program, now we have high school players in our program for our sixth grader to come into our program um, and then be able to see somebody from their neighborhood playing at the high school level and going, oh, I want to be that person. Um, and that person understands, you know, what's it like growing up in Oakland? They know the different schools. They know what it means to be down by the lake. Um, I think building that pipeline for us is the most important thing so that, and, and, and ultimately what we want to create um, are Oakland kids coaching our Oakland kids. So we have our high school kids coach our middle school kids during the summer um, and really creating that community pipeline. Um, but I would also agree that the more opportunities that they can see players that look like them playing, um, the stronger they can vision themselves of, hey, that's what I want to become. Right. What can, what, can, what can we do, and this is just throwing it out there, what can be done to help facilitate that? Um, not to put you on the spot, but I am Chaz, you're coaching a college team now, <laughs> predominantly black school. Um, I know you've got a thousand things probably racing through your head in the last few days, but um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that just from your Nation United experience too? Yeah, I I do have a a thousand things running through my head, and um, and I think I'm I'm coming on sort of on the tail end of this, and 
Um, I don't know. I think, I, I think there's, there's so many different ways. Like I'm listening to the Howard conversation and um, I don't know if it's been brought up, um, but I think, you know, kind of the elephant in the room is Howard's got to put more into that program too. You know, it's not just about, uh, you know, it's not just about who's going to play them and when and, and get them to a certain place. Like that program needs to be more successful, especially given as long as it's been around. Um, and we're in the same boat at Hampton. Like we've, we've had those conversations, like we have to put more into it. And um, fortunately we have uh, a team of people that's really willing to get behind it right now. Um, but that's, that's a big piece of it. Cause it's, you know, when, when we get it together, then that's going to enable us to, whether it's a, a showcase or whether it's reaching out and, and um, you know, partnering with some grassroots programs or whatever that, that helps. But if we're not organized at the top, we're not doing what we need to do, then it doesn't work out as well. And, and if, if we don't have the players in there that make it appealing, then it, it doesn't work out as either because no, no kid wants to, um, you know, every kid wants to be successful. So if, if when they look up, the people that, they, that they're looking at are not, uh, not seeing that success, it's not as appealing, it's not as enticing. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we've done well with Nation United. Um, you know, it, it's never all about winning, but with Nation United, we, we were very conscious of the fact that, yeah, th this program is going to make a splash when we first show up, but it's only going to make a splash if we're successful. And so when we rostered our teams, that was a, that was way up at the top is making sure that we had players that were top level caliber players, um, you know, as examples for everybody else. Uh, we didn't want to just put together a diverse team and say, "Hey, we got a we got a team that doesn't that doesn't help the cause," um, you know. So I think there is some stuff that that we can do from from the top level down at Hampton, but uh, we got to get our own ducks in a row first. And I don't know if that answers the question at all, but it's just kind of where I am right now. No, it makes sense. I mean, you, you, like you said, you've you've got to have a product that people want to gravitate towards. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of kids do see programs as are they winning or losing, and that's how they decide if they want to go, which is probably not the best way to do it, but that's what they do. Um, I welcome in Troy Kemp back to the panel, too. Um, we are fully loaded now, so I'm just going to sit back and let y'all take it over. <laughs> Matt, I, I have a two cents to, to add to this. Um, yeah, please. There's two things that come to mind in relationship to Howard. First of all, one of the things I have been doing of late was interviewing women in the sport of lacrosse, coaches and players. And the thing that keeps coming up with the coaches is a lack of equity that comes out of athletic departments in terms of funding uh, women's sports. And so if Howard is going to be successful, as Chad says, the administration has to step up and make sure they have the same funding to be successful as the teams are going to compete against. Now, what I did know, and I wondered what Amy was talking about, um, them trying to get games. I, I wondered how much of this is the uh, subconscious racism. I, I know from coaching my daughter, how many penalties are called on her compared mm. to her teammates. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, a, a wow. friend of mine that for forever, uh, a white dude that played at Cornell, same age as me, and played with Aaron Jones. And for so long, we would try to educate him about the structural racism, subconscious bias that happens. He never got it until he was coaching either last year or the year before, uh, he had a team that had four African-American girls. And he was absolutely shocked of how many penalties were called on these girls and how many times these girls were fouled and nothing was called on the white girls that fouled them. To the point where he went berserk. He, he, like, he went after the referees. And after that incident, he came back to me and Aaron and was like, I get it. I get it. And uh, the guy who coaches with me and, and has seen the same thing, he said the same thing about how they call fouls on my daughter in a game. 
and it, it's subconscious bias. So that, that's one thing that came back to you. Now, the other thing I would say, which I think is the elephant in every room in this discussion about how do we diversify the sport is increasingly, I don't know if I would have the same opportunities I did in the era I came up. First of all, in the Hudson Valley, New York, lacrosse was a public school game. I mean, that's who excelled in lacrosse. Uh, if I grew up in Baltimore and some of these other schools of which lacrosse is a private school game, I don't know if I would have had the opportunity because my parents certainly didn't have the money to send me to one of these schools that excel in lacrosse. Uh, we also know, and Trevor, I would love to hear your, your take on this, as long as lacrosse continues to be a pay to play, that is a structural wall that prevents the diversifying of the sport economically. And whether we like it or not, there's a direct correlation in this society between wealth and skin pigmentation. And then as long as that correlation continues to exist where uh, African Americans lag behind uh, white Americans in dollars for every dollar, an African American has a white person and that family has five, it makes it really difficult to play our sport because that barrier is there. So we got to end the structural barriers to playing the game. We got to deal with the subconscious bias when it, when it comes to training referees. I think that's important. And I think we got to deal with the inequity that women's sports continues to have. That's a problem. My wife had some of those. Well, oh, thank, yeah. thank you all so much. So I do not have a lacrosse background other than being married to my husband. Hi, Harry. Hey. <laughs> Of mine. Okay, so that's so interesting. Mrs. Opie, she she taught me at, in business school, and uh, she was my favorite professor. Oh, thank you so much. And by the way, her husband uh, is a uh, an old friend of mine. I used to call him for advice right after I graduated college. He was like, "Who's this kid calls me?" <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I can get into that later. But good to see everyone. Good to see you, Trevor. Good to see you, Chaz and everyone else. So it's a small world. So what I was going to say, what's interesting is I, whenever I do this work, so I have a consulting firm and I, I also teach business. One of the things that I talk about when we're trying to, to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion is that you first have to identify the barriers to it. And many times, and there's different levels of analysis. So many times organizations focus on individual barriers. So they'll say, well, the women are not assertive enough. The women need to learn how to lean in and speak up. But what we fail to look at, and my husband sort of alluded to it, are the institutional levels. And so a few things that you, my husband mentioned, money. I would also say the network. The networks and the role models that are put out there, which is, and then I would say the exposure and the value of the sport. So when I met my husband, I had heard of, when he said he played ball, and he said lacrosse. I said, you mean the native, the indigenous people sport? Like, I, I, I just knew he was talking about basketball or football. Why? Because in my network, lacrosse was not the sport that people played. We had never been exposed to that. And so I often wonder if exposure to lacrosse have to, has to happen at an earlier age. So when I'm having the same conversation, for example, with law firms or professional services firms, and they're trying to figure out how to increase diversity at the partner level, they often start at the year or two before the decision is made. And I say, no, you need to dig deeper. You need to go back farther in the process because a year or two before they're ready to become partners, it's too late. And I would say to you all, a year or two before someone's supposed to go to college, it's probably too late for them to be exposed to the sport. And I know that there are organizations that focus on that. And, and what I say now may be a little bit controversial, but I actually think the organizations and the schools themselves need to, need to institutionalize these processes. Too often, I find that we, so there are, Harlem Lacrosse is awesome. We love them. We, my husband has volunteered with them. But if Harlem lacrosse is the only way that you are interacting with black athletes, there's a problem. Every school needs to institutionalize these processes. You need to also not solely rely on volunteers. If we were talking about how do you increase diversity of your faculty or how do you teach people how to do math, et cetera, or coaches, you would, you would hopefully hire someone professionally. You would pay them. 
But for some reason, the conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and inclusion is often based on volunteers, outsourcing. And I think do you have to have a fundamental paradigm shift around the value of it? Because if you really value it, you will pay for it. Another thing that I'd say, the final thing is, I think we have to consider the climate of the sport. Is it hospitable or is it hostile? Because I will tell you as a mother on the sidelines, watching my daughter get jacked up on the field, that's not how, that, I would, my husband knew, he was like, Tina, you cannot go on the field. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, you cannot do that. But I'll tell you, it was very difficult as a parent. And if it wasn't for my husband, I might've pulled my daughter out of the sport because it literally felt like a hostile attack on her by other players. I mean, we had another player, this was in another sport, but it's still the same issue, who threatened our daughter. We have referees who are making these crazy calls, other coaches who are inquiring about her. I mean, it is, it is absolutely ridiculous. And so what that says to me is that there are institutional level issues around training. I think every coach should be fluent in diversity, equity, and inclusion. It shouldn't be a nice to have. It should be a necessity. And I think it should be tied to incentive structures. So th that's the, because you measure what matters and what matters is what you measure. And if there's no linkage to compensation, it's often difficult to change behaviors. So I will pause there before I start preaching. <laughs> Well said. And here and and here's and I've had this conversation with a lot of people as well. Is that diversity and inclusion can't be some shit that you go to in the office because someone made you go to a day. Oh, I did my eight hours. Like I just had this conversation with one of my teammates, Ginger Miles, who played with me at Virginia. Like it, there needs to be more stock in it. You need to have to commit to something. It can't just be like, oh, well, I did my hour on the computer. Like that does nothing. Like, it's not just like, oh, I posted my black square for nothing. Like, it, what does that mean? Like, just because you do it for a week, for a month, like this is not a week, a month, a day. Like, I'm just trying to look cool. I did it because my boss told me to. It's like, it's a commitment. Like it is a heartfelt, deep commitment. And if you're not in it and if it doesn't apply to you, I hate to say it, but no one gives a shit. Like, that's what I've like learned is like, if it's not directly affecting you as a person, people just don't give a shit. They just want to be a part of what's cool. And, you know, I've called some people out and I'm sure I've lost some friends and I could care less, but you know, I've said to them, I'm like, you don't even know why you did the black, like, do you even know what's going on here? And they're like, Oh, I just saw it. And I'm like, well, that's dumb. You now look dumb. Like educate yourself on why you're doing these things so that you can actually make an impact and have an influence on change because change isn't just, Oh, I went to it because my diversity inclusion, like why, like why does it have to be called diversity inclusion? Why can't it just be like, be a good person and not a shithead? Like mm -hmm. treat people the right way. Like, I just don't understand why we have to like, like I get why we systematically have to have a name for it because I just feel like that's putting people in boxes. And I've been arguing with people about like the allyship. I'm like, I don't want to be an ally. I just want to be a good pe person who treats people the right way. Like, I don't think it needs a name for me personally to attach to it. And that may be really loaded and, and I'm sorry to people, but I don't need to have a name to it because I feel like that systematically is now going to start something else. Oh, we called it this. Oh, we called it allyship. So now it's a different way to reform a racist thought. And I don't know, like just something doesn't feel right to me to call it that. Like, I just feel like everyone needs to check themselves on how to treat human beings. Um, and just going to like an hour diversity inclusion thing because your your boss and your department asked you to, to me is just like, you know, crossing your T's and dotting your I's and saying I did it. And if someone comes back at you to sue you, you could say you went to it, you know? Um, so I just think it needs to be deeper and it need, needs to be a little bit more heartfelt. And um, if it doesn't affect you, um, you like, you, we have to find a way to make it as passionate as like maybe some of us are um, because it affects us on a daily life. And I just don't see that in my, in some of my friends, I see some of them starting a little bit. Um, but some people are just like, Oh, I put this back black square up. And I'm like, you don't even know what you're talking about. You know, like it just, oh, yeah. I don't know. I just, I don't know what anyone else feels well, about. For, for the record, uh, be a good person and not a shithead is too many characters. That's why it's diverse. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to, um, can y'all hear me? Are we good? Yeah. So thank y'all for sharing. Thanks for the invite, Matt. Um, so you got, you got, you got two things working. Um, 
when it when it comes to the the game changing. And again, spending time for those of you who don't know me, I spent time in Chattanooga, Tennessee, building a program at the Macaulay School for 27 years. And as a person that didn't grow up playing lacrosse. You know, I played football, basketball. First of all, I played the stuff that was most readily available. In basketball, a lot of us played basketball because it didn't cost anything. All you needed was a ball and, and, and some nets that would stay up for just a little while. Um, but one of the things that I realized is I'm, I'm looking at, um, when you talk about growing the game and having more kids be involved, you know, there's, there's not just wealth, there's a social capital piece, right? So we talked about the models. And one way that I was able to sort of create momentum and energy is to is to is to work with the opinion leaders see i think of it like schools you know you can put all the energy and effort into the students but if you don't put it into the teachers and the parents it's going to get interesting right you got to operate at the c-suite level if you want to change things right mm -hmm. and so and i still call it c-suite suite in lacrosse coaching you know just like minority owned businesses or whatever you want to call it you're going to look out and find people and, and try to do programs and implement things that are valuable to you. You know, as an African-American coach, I remember walking on the field with 10, 12 brothers out there, people looking at us, and you're talking about officials calling it one way or another. Well, one, because the kids were great and they felt like these kids have got an advantage, so let me level the playing field. The second thing is they just, it, they, you know, I, they just, I, for some reason, felt like taking up for the underdog, whatever their bias was. But I would say this, one, you know, the opinion leaders, and I always talk about, I know we talked about this on your last show, Matt, I went after the football coaches and the basketball coaches because if I got them to buy in and look at this as an important sport, then I could move the needle there. But, the, but ultimately, you can get all these kids to play. But if they can't pay the price of admission for these events right now, who's out there being watched right now? It, you know, or creating video. Now, the coaches are not out there, but the ones that are in tournaments are the ones who can pay for it, who can get on a flight, and parents can take vacations who can invest in the travel teams. And you might have that scholarship kid every now and then, but just like in an independent school, that kid's gotta be good enough academically or something. They gotta be an outlier. So you can't even be an ordinary person that might be an extraordinary person in the right way if you don't have the keys to it. And so for me, the interesting thing was, like my son played at Carolina and some other things. He was a very good football player, but he was an outstanding lacrosse player because the same skill set transferred differently, right? And so ultimately, when I look at the impediments, it is all about the people calling the, calling the shots, right? The people who are coaching and driving it. Look, your budget is a moral document in a school. Your budget is a moral document in your business. So if there's no dollars invested, right? Just like paying the coaches, then it's not real. This is just something to talk about, not to be about. So for me, it's investing, getting the C-suite leveled out a little bit so that the people who have the ability to use their budgets and their influence and their power and their network to bring and, and engage these young people, if that's not happening, it's just going to be temporary like a match. It can be hot as hell for a minute, but it's going to go out. And that's what I've seen. So building a program, I was in the C-suite. I was in the coaches' suite. Then I was in the admission seat. And it wasn't just looking, but people saw me from farther away now. Hey, he's a brother coaching. He's been at that school for 20 years. It's safe for my son to be there. He's going to be treated fairly on the field and in the classroom. Now they're coming. But if, if you're not safe, you're not coming. So some of these kids don't necessarily feel safe at a certain point. And then others just don't have the access because it costs a few more pesos or dollars or yen or whatever you need to get in. Let me, let me, I've been dying to get in here. Uh, everyone said such, such amazing things. And I'm going to try to tie it into what everyone said so far. Um, but what you were talking about, in my work, what I do, we can talk about that later, but you have to get executive buy-in. And from the top, you've been talking about the C-suite. And, and then you have to be able to incentivize everyone, all the employees, everyone that works for you horizontally and vertically, um, because they're going to be, they're going to be scared of, retribution, they're gonna be scared that, am I gonna get dinged because I'm spending more time on diversity or inclusion? Uh, and, and this is not a part of my mandate. Um, how do you evaluate me? And so they're worried about all these things. And then going back to what Amy was talking about, like be a good person and you know, don't be an asshole. I think it's really important for a person in leadership to identify it, describe it, and then work towards dismantling it. And it has to come from up top 
because if it doesn't come from up top from a person of leadership or perceived power, then no one else is going to listen to it or buy in from the bottom up. And it's something that I've been doing with my brother is we've been doing implicit bias uh, presentations with a lot of college teams. We did it first with the University of Maryland. Uh, it was after the eight minutes and 46 seconds. I felt compelled to go out and do something in the immediate community that I, I had a direct tie to, which was lacrosse. And I reached out to Coach Tillman. I DM'd him, hey, are you going to come out with a statement, a Black Lives Matter statement? He said, Harry, I, I've been really mulling this over, and you were the reason. Uh, now, now I feel more confident to go forward and do it. And I helped him with the draft. And then we moved on to do a Zoom with the entire team, incoming uh, freshmen. And it was really well received. Um, and we got a lot of good feedback. And since then, we worked with University of Vermont, UMass, uh, Boston, Jacksonville, uh, several other colleges, Gonzaga High School, Loyola in LA. And, the, and what me and my brother do in this, it's not a lecture. And we make it really interactive when we do these exercises where they can put stuff in the chat. We ask some questions um, to really expose their privilege. And we do this from the jump. And we also start with multimedia. So we always, we throw on uh, the Matthew McConaughey uncomfortable conversation piece because what white kid doesn't like Matthew McConaughey? What, what person doesn't like Matthew McConaughey? And the whole point is, is to get people set. And you've got to start with first principles and you've got to say, hey, this is going to be really uncomfortable. And you can tell by Matthew McConaughey, if you watch the whole thing for 20 minutes, he is in complete discomfort. But in discomfort, there's a lot of growth. And then we, and then we talk about why, is there, why are these uncomfortable conversations? It's because 75% of people or their social networks are of the same race and same background, same experiences. And it's, and it's most obvious if you go on Facebook, there's, a, there's an echo chamber, there's a bubble, right? It's people from your past, where you came from, instead of the people you should be meeting in the future. Um, and so we set that, and then we, we do three questions to really expose their, uh, that they might have some conscious uh, manner or belief. We ask them, put in the chat, um, what's the first thing that comes to mind when we say baseball player? They all just go right in. What's the first thing that comes to mind uh, when you hear of someone that goes to landing? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Someone that goes uh, to Martha's Vineyard. They literally, they all throw in the exact same thing. And, th and then they all turn, they all look at each other on this, you know, on the screen and like, holy cow, maybe we're all more alike than we think. And maybe we, we aren't that diverse or maybe we need to get out more and talk to other people. Are we actually hurting ourselves? Are we hurting other people unintentionally? Are we contributing to racism? And that's where we start the presentation. And then we go into the historical context, what's the slightest to today. And then we give our own personal background and then we provide actual steps. But I think for, for us, the biggest thing would be my brother, when we started, we, we moved from Indiana to DC. My dad played football at Wisconsin. He met my mom in Indiana. She went to IU, it's a big 10 family. We came to DC, went from public school to private school. First day of school, everyone had lacrosse sticks. And we're like, what are these tennis rackets? These look funny. And as soon, everyone had two sticks. And as soon as we picked up a stick, we never put it down. For me, the creators game, that day, just picking up a stick on the recess court, that was diversity. Inclusion is when, is when you stay. And it was that group of people that made us feel welcome. From that day on, we had a click that we still talk to today. And where this leads to, to my adulthood, I grew up idolizing Trevor, and one of his teammates and best friends, Jesse Hubbard, was a cousin of one of my best friends that I grew up with. After the recession, me and my brother graduated college, we noticed that the public schools at DC did not have any of the cross teams. But we also noticed that a lot of these uh, kids that were at the private schools, they couldn't afford to be there anymore. And so they started, there was an influx into the public schools of all these kids that went to middle school playing lacrosse, and all of a sudden they couldn't play anymore because it wasn't organized at the public high school. And so I reached out to the AD, and this ties into what you, you're, you're seeing, uh, Chaz. I reached out to the AD. I said, hey, I think there's a real big opportunity here, and I think we can really do something really magical. All these kids are literally circled around, including my high school, St. Albans, this, this public school, Wilson High School, was circled around Georgetown Day, Sidwell Friends, 
St. Albans and several other private schools all playing lacrosse. And then there's these kids that felt like outcasts. And not only do they feel like outcasts now, they probably, there might be something uh, that's happening to them that they might not realize till later on mentally or psychologically. Um, we launched the first DC public high school lacrosse team. And we did it all with the equipment from all my friends in fourth grade that we met on the first day, including Jesse Hubbard, who ended up coaching me and I ended up playing with them. All the lacrosse sticks that we fielded from, for that first team at Wills High School is from our childhood. Um, and then going now, and Chaz, you're trying to expand all the HBCUs, or you're talking about what's the next step. Today, every, almost every public high school in D.C. has a lacrosse team, and they have their own league now. And that's a legacy that I can hang my hat on and say that I'm really proud of. But that started because of diversity and inclusion. And I think that uh, – there's a living legacy of this happening in other places that we can repeat and scale and make it repeatable. But like, like I was going back to, you have to identify, you have to describe it, then you have to dismantle it. And right now, after George Floyd, I've been, it's a soul fight. And I, I don't mince words. I go right at people and I say, hey, you need to actually do something about it. And you need to call them out. And because otherwise, you're going to have what happened at Amherst. That, that's a cultural problem and culture will eat your strategy every day. And you better believe that those instances that happened this year have been happening for years. And I wonder about every person that called me nigger on the field in middle school, high school and college. They're all coaching now. They're all coaching some other kids. They're all coaching some other group of kids. They're influencing other assistant coaches and it's, and it's, it's contributing to systemic racism that the Oakley family was talking about. Uh, but I think right now, and I'll stop talking after a second, I think right now um, we have to live in the present, see what's happening, but also we need to live in the future as well and build what's missing. And so right now what's missing is actual change uh, to annihilate and disband the systemic system. And I think there's a number of ways to do that. And I think that's going to come together between partnership and collaboration and not living in isolation and in silence. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I just want, uh, Kevin, you want to go? Uh, Trevor, you go. I've gone before, so go ahead. Okay. I, I just wanted to kind of circle back to the question that, that Fred posed before around how, um, you know, so how we take care of some of the hurdles in the game of, of getting kids seen, getting them recruited. Troy, I think you talked about this as well. And uh, Matt, you put together an interesting group of people here because if you think about the game just in general for all players, you have the pyramid, the base of it, which is uh, all the kids that we get playing the game uh, at the rec level, at the youth level, just getting them introduced to the game for the first time. Then you kind of have uh, the middle level, which I'm involved with, with, with club teams. And I know club teams is kind of a, a dirty word in the lacrosse world, but club teams are a lot like people. You have, <laughs> you have some bad club teams out there that just roll the ball out and uh, charge a lot of money. And then you have some really good teams that work hard uh, for their kids and prepare them uh, not only for their future in lacrosse, but uh, off the field as well. Um, and so I'm involved in that, that wrong. And then, then you have uh, college coaches on, on this call. And, and so the, to, to help usher kids to that next level, um, and, and again, I think Troy brought this up, there are some, there are some major hurdles around uh, costs of club teams, flights, recruiting tournaments, these type of things. Um, over the past uh, several years, we've developed a great relationship with City Lax. Uh, Denver City Lax, they're right in our backyard here. Uh, ben, ben Allison and Rod Allison, they do a tremendous job of uh, doing that part that, uh, that Harry was talking about with the diversity part, bringing them in, into the game for the first time and growing that, that aspect of the game. And what we've just done is uh, try to support them in any way, get kids uh, in our program from a young age. So when they're not playing with City Lax in the spring, we get their top players to come play with us, uh, get them involved in our teams, uh, and, and then usher them through through the high school level. And our parents, our parents in our club program, uh, our demographic is very wealthy. They have a lot of resources, so they are not afraid to um, throw their airline points around, 
help pay for kids registration. We, we have severe challenges because we're a, a university school, uh, pro, uh, university club program. So we have NCAA guidelines that we have to follow. And uh, so other parents will help pay the kids way in high school so that they, that they can still be a part of it, pay for their individual showcases, go, uh, go off to school. And, and last year we had, you know, I'm very proud, although I'll never take credit for kids going and playing division one or any college lacrosse because it's their own hard work. But Cole Finley Ponds from City Lax played for us for like five years, went to Hopkins. I'm sorry, Harry. I know that's <laughs> not a, that's not, that's not a compliment in your world, but, uh, and then, uh, uh August, uh, Stally went to, to Richmond. And so starting to develop that pipeline, um, get, get the college coaches to know that we have that city lax pipeline, um, coming through our program. And then, uh, you know, programs like, uh, Chaz is, is starting with nations. It, it, it's not, there, there are some hurdles, but like I said, if you know the right tournaments to get to, you know which coaches to get in front of. And, and one of the, you know, we're all going through the, the summer of hell right now with all of this, but um, one of the upsides to COVID is I think college coaches are really learning to use video and, and use game film to watch kids play. And that is going to open so many doors because if we can just, you know, I've just been filming games down here against the other good Colorado teams. If I can just get game films off the coaches and they're willing to watch and willing to recruit that way, that, that, that takes care of a lot of these issues. So I'm hoping uh, that continues forward. Um, so that, you know, again, I just want to reiterate how amazing it is. Guys like Kevin out in the world growing the game from that base level, that, that's where it all starts. But then uh, people, like myself that are part of the more, uh, you know, uh, that, that more, uh, that tighter network, that harder to reach network that we've got to get involved with those groups and find avenues to get their best kids and, and help usher them uh, up to the higher levels. If that's what, if that's what they want to do, Where no one should be forced to play college lacrosse by any means, but uh, if that's what they want to do, we can help them uh, achieve, uh, hopefully achieve that dream. Yeah, I wanted to, um, so many good points are being made here. Uh, first, to, to Harry's point, um, you know, when the George Floyd incident happened, um, that's something that with all of our Oakland Lacrosse Club kids, we would have talked in person with, but because of shelter in place, uh, we couldn't. So we partnered with a group called Our Joy, a restorative justice uh, group that had racial healing conversations. So we did it with our parents, we did it with our high school kids, we did it with our middle school kids. And, you know, what became so apparent as an organization, and what I'm hearing here is, we just don't talk about racism a lot. And people are so uncomfortable talking about it. Um, they're so uncomfortable making mistakes. They're so uncomfortable saying the wrong thing um, that we don't get the chance to talk about it. Um, and so I think one, just as an organization, what we've learned for it are creating those spaces for our coaches, families, kids. Um, and we're really fortunate in Oakland. Oakland, along with being the greatest city in the United States, is also the most diverse. So our group is, you know, 30% Latino, about 30% Asian, and 30% African American. So it kind of just brings those conversations together, uh, and and you know, purposely making us uncomfortable having those. I think second, a lot of times when I when I talk to people that support Oakland Lacrosse, or I talk to just people in the lacrosse world, they're imaging a pipeline of like, oh, Oakland kid, right to UVA, or Oakland kid, and kind of Trevor ended with that, that may not be what the kid wants. And what we want to do in Oakland, similar to what Tina was saying before, is we want to expand the sport so that every kid in Oakland public schools gets the opportunity to play, gets the opportunity to be on a team. Um, in Oakland, typically soccer and basketball and football are the main sports. Now they can create a new identity for themselves by trying something new. And I feel like there just needs to be more base work at the public school level, getting kids more opportunities. Because uh, what will help diversify the game is just purely more kids playing and more people of color just around the country playing, the way to do that is through the public school system. Um, and so we gotta put money towards that and we've gotta invest in that. And that's why for us, um, we start at the sixth grade level. Uh, there's 12 major public schools in Oakland and we're at nine of them in terms of introducing the sport. And we're in the process of working with the district of creating a varsity girls team at every high school to support them in their title nine. And whether or not an Oakland lacrosse club kid goes off to play in college isn't important. What's important is to develop all the incredible things that are inherent to sports. You know, positive communication, good teammate. And when we create that, eventually kids are gonna go to college because they're gonna love it and they're gonna build their skills. But I think um, we really, and, and, and the final point I'll make is sometimes too, I think there are 
assume values that are like white upper class values that people are like are asserting on our kids like they want to go in this pathway and for myself for our Oakland lacrosse club kids every decision we make is based on like what does the community want what do the kids want and what's what, what do they think is best um and that goes from you know our field is century located we provide transportation we provide all the equipment and what the kids say is the best thing that we provide we provide food at every practice so they know that like they automatically get you know a healthy snack when they come to us and they're like keep doing the food we'll keep coming so um but i think and then i guess my one final point is to amy ginger miles is our Oakland lacrosse board president so love her um i think it is important beyond the good person we have to call it systematic racism that harry's calling it we're working with our league right now and second we've got to have conversations about it and i think my role as a white person is i've got to call it the racism every time i see it and i've got to like stand up for our kids our coaches of color and you know my colleagues so and that's my responsibility kevin can i I just wanted to follow up on something you said, and because I really am enjoying the conversation, and this is obviously offered in love. You made it. You made the comment that we don't talk about race a lot, and that we're really uncomfortable talking about race. And I think it's important to label as white people who probably don't talk about race, and white people who are probably yep. uncomfortable. I may be tired of talking about race. I might not feel like discussing it today because someone was just murdered, or I'm sad. But I think it's really important because what we're, what we're trying to do is surface sort of those assumptions and, the, and look at the language that we're using even when we have these conversations. It's really important that we become more accurate. And Amy, to your point, I think that's why we do have to have these labels. Because if we say, just treat everybody like a human, I agree with you. I, my husband and I were having this debate the other day. I really wish I could go out and just be. You know, people didn't say, oh, well, you can't do that because you're a woman or because you're Black. But unfortunately, we have these social constructs called race and gender. So I'm a Black woman. And if we do away with those labels, how would we then be able to measure change. the change and experiences yeah. and inequities? You ha and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion is a specific subset of behaviors that are focused on change. So if we just call them being a good person, for example, which I agree with you. I agree with you. It's ridiculous to me when people look at me and won't hire me for a job because I'm black. That, that's, I'm like, well, it's your fault. I mean, I have, we happen to be very proud of people. I'm like, you're just missing out, dude. Your organization is not going to be awesome if you don't hire me. Um, so, but without those labels, we don't have the opportunity, for example, to track medical disparities or even the conversation we're having now. You wouldn't be able to track it without the limits. So I understand what you mean. It can't just be performative, but I do think that it can be insightful and instructive if we use the terms in the proper way. Um, 100%. I, you just got I, real I, smart on me. You just put you just put my lacrosse coach booty right in line. Appreciate that. <laughs> Sign up for my class, Amy. Sign up for my class. <laughs> and hey, uh, Echo, uh, good call on my end. Uh, totally heard what you said. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Kevin. We're getting, ready, we're getting ready to bounce, but I, I will have to say I'm going to put you on the spot. Christina, I want to hear your comment before I jet. But please, what were you going to share? Sorry, put you on the spot, but I want to hear from you. Ah. <sighs> Um, as far as what Tina was saying about, um, that black people are having a conversation all the time about racism and inequality and, and white people are, are not, I, I, I think that I was very lucky to have the opportunities I did being of a part of um, Matt Holman's family where I got to often be a, included in conversations that maybe a lot of other white people didn't get to hear. Um, and growing up, my um, oldest and closest friend was black and I spent a lot of time at her house because I didn't have such a good house. So I got to also be a part of that, absorbed in that kind of family and and I, I agree that there are a lot of conversations being had in certain people's homes that are not being had in, in white people's homes. And, and, and we need more of that because I, I, I think part of it is, is 
I think white people are afraid to say something without sounding like jerks, you know, and <laughs> um, if I can make it easier for you, you're, yeah. you're, you're saying some amazing things. And I think you put your finger on the pulse of what many, when, when I coach executives, when I do consulting with organizations, this is a common theme. And what I say to them is, well, you're going to look like a jerk. You are going to <laughs> fail. You are going to say something racist or sexist or homophobic. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. Because we need to bring those conversations that are being had in privacy behind closed doors into right. the public square and learn how to have authentic public discourse. We don't know how to do that. We yell at each other, we shout at each other, we label each other, we go back to our own individual corners. Or we have to cyber cowards. Right. Well, and I think also, you know, one thing I've noticed is that there's so many white people working so hard to prove they're not racist. Um, that when the conversations are being, ha when the conversations do occur, that they're working so hard just to show like, oh, well, I'm not a racist person, you know, everyone else is, but I'm, I'm not. Um, instead of just being open to, to hearing what's being said and, and, and maybe learning a little bit more that day than, than you did before you had that conversation. And so um, it's hard, right? It's hard to do, but it, it needs to be done. And, and so, you know, one thing that I had discussed with, with Matt after um, George Floyd's murder is, is, you know, how, how, do, how do we reach out to those people who are so isolated as white people that they don't even, you know, know black people personally? How do, how do we get to them? Because they're so isolated. How, how do you get to them to make the change there, right? Because there's already change happening right here, right? We're, we're all open to having that conversation, but how do you reach those people who have isolated themselves so much that they're, they're not having those conversations? Um, Christina, can I jump on that one right there? I love what you just said. I just got to dive in on that one. The bridge is white people. See, black right. people don't have, right? Because of degrees of, the degrees of separation, I love that. You teed that up perfectly, and I hope everybody in America watches this. Because you don't have to be one degree of separation from somebody um, who, who looks different to understand. You got to do the work, and it's got to be somebody in the middle, right? You don't have two cities connect without a bridge in the middle sometimes, mm -hmm. right? So, so I really do appreciate you saying that. Um, but I will add this one thing, because Fred, you, I mean, y'all about to bounce. Because I need to approach this when you when you learn about systems thinking and one reason why i notice is i'm doing these vanderbilt courses so i might sound smart not op level smart but i'm gonna sound something here um so when you learn about systems um you learn that only about six percent of organizational dysfunction is on a human level on an individual level what it means is 94 percent of the dysfunction is systematic and so when you have these conversations, particularly difficult conversations, someone says, I'm not racist, I'm not whatever, but do you believe that this system is racist, right? It's like, we can talk about the tire or the steering wheel or the horn, who we wanna blame it on, but it's the car that hit somebody, right? So it's the car, not just the tire. So the person might be the tire. I didn't do anything, I was on the other side of the car. It's this one that ran them over. But it's the car, which is the system. So when you, you know, I'm, I'm learning more about organization because if you want to dismantle something, you have to understand what the root cause is. So that's what a lot of this work is, root cause analysis. Where did it come from? You know, I didn't even make this drink. I'm just drinking it. I didn't even know where it come from, but now I know where it comes from. I'm not drinking this fountain anymore. But that's my point. So it takes white people. Look, even with the civil rights movement, it didn't work without people. It was, right. it was black people. Oh, you over here. But I think that's the beauty of it, is that you can do things, for example, that I can't even do because you know people that I don't even know who don't want to know me, right? <laughs> and the same thing is I can do certain things. So thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry for interrupting, but boy, no. Lord, jump oh. in it right now. <laughs> I, um, I, I fully agree with what you're saying. And uh, I'm having difficulty finding the words to say, the, peop the people that, that great, are the most, what? You're well, the people great, that I, 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 you know, I most want to reach out to are, are people who wouldn't even associate with someone like me because 
I am someone who associates with, you know, those people who watch Laura Ingram. Like, I, I don't, I don't really, how do I get to them? Because I, I don't move in circles with people like them. And, um, is it, and so, you know, Matt can attest to this. I, there's many times over the years where I've gotten into arguments with people at gas stations and taco shops and grocery stores and um, in line at the bank because I overhear them saying something that's racist and I, I can't keep my mouth shut. Um, but I don't know how much those people then are walking away saying, well, that lady's crazy or I've actually made them think about what I had to say and, and they're gonna maybe reflect on it. I think the 20, 60, 20 rule might be helpful. So I have built a large community, it's called Shared Sisterhood, it's a Facebook group, you're welcome to join it, where we're reaching out to people who may not have any black friends. That's the first thing. But the 20, 60, 20 rule is something that there's a professor named Dolly Chuck. She's a professor at Stern School of Business. She wrote a book called Being the Person You Need to Be. And in this, in this, this equation is it, is it says that you can divide the population into three general categories. So you have the top 20%. Those are your friends. That's your mama and your cousins. No matter what you do, they're going to be in your corner. Okay? You don't have to influence them. They agree with you. The bottom 20% are your foes. No matter what you say, they're not going to be convinced. You're not going to influence them, okay? What Dally Chug suggests and what I found to be very effective, I focus on that middle 60% who could go either way. And so what does that mean? I am not going up to a stranger at a taco stand <laughs> because your girl might get murdered. I mean, honestly, but but I'm being very real. I mean, my husband can tell you, I'm, you can probably tell he's spicy, Matt, you know that, but, but I'm probably the louder, more outspoken one when it comes to those kinds of things. But I, you, you, we recognize our boundaries because if they're in the bottom 20%, I'm wasting my time, precious energy and time that could have been spent on the sick middle 60% that's going to eventually affect change. And what I say is the bottom 20% doesn't have to stay that way. Mm -hmm. It might be that I return to them and they're more, they've moved towards the 60%. But I, I think that that has been very helpful for me as a framework to recognize that sometimes people aren't ready. And if they're not ready, I need to focus on people who are. Mm. Yeah, let me, real quick, I was going to say, too, and how do you know they're in that bottom 20%? When they watch Laura Ingram. There's, there's a scripture that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So if you hear stuff run out of people's mouth, they're identifying where they are. And people shift over a period of time. I'm certainly not the same person I was as a junior college student. But... You, you do have to watch. You know, my, my old saying, my wife will tell you, I, I never spit into a fan. There's no sense of spitting into a fan. It will go right back on. I'm going to steal thing, that. One thing I'd like to. Can you guys stay on? <laughs> like, really? <laughs> <laughs> right, so we're we're going to stay a little bit later, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. One thing I, I'd just like to add is, am I on? There I am. Um, you know, to your to your question, Christine is, I, I brought this up on my first um, uh, podcast talking about this with Fred, and I think another thing, um, learning about race, uh, racism, and learning about our biases is really important, and I feel like it's important for uh, white people to learn about their own culture because I feel like we're a very uncultured people, and one of the issues with white is that the label of white or the label of black or the label of African American or the able of, label of Asian American is it flattens pe people. You know, if we just say people are Asian Americans, you could be talking about a Korean American, you could be talking about a Chinese American. There's a lot of different ways that when we talk about white people, you know, the, these, uh, these, these uh, cosplay nerds running around talking about white supremacy. I'm like, what, how, how dare you? Like, how, how do you take, my color skin and and and, lab, and 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 lump me into and lump me into that and i get i get the point of those labels because they're important for us to know privileges and know where uh things stand like like 
uh, Dr. Tino will be talking about. But the, the reason I bring up the point of white people learning their own culture is that the more we remember our ancestors, we, the more we go back into remembering our own culture. First of all, the less we take from other people, we don't try to cherry pick from other people's cultures. Uh, we start to learn uh, ways to have a more cultured life, so we appreciate culture in other people. We don't we don't um, shake our head at it, or we don't look at it as different, or we don't uh, we we start to appreciate culture just just in general. And, and finally, um, you know, if we learn about our an, an, our own ancestors' oppression, then maybe we can start to have some sort of open heart for the oppression. Uh, that people of color are living through in the, in this time and place, and so you, you know, I, I know my an Irish ancestors weren't welcomed in uh, to the United States when when they first came came over on a boat. I, I know um, their religion back way back uh, to the to my my Celtic ancestors. Their religions were were taken away by some of the same forces that are trying to control society today. So um, I think the more we also learn about our own history, the more, uh, the, the more valuable um, or, or, or the more open we are in these conversations uh, with, with others. Right. I could be uh, completely wrong on some of those points too. No, point, point well taken. And you're right, you're, you're talking about racial hierarchy, right? And you're talking about the power and the policies, but also the racist ideas that that perpetuate all these stereotypes and everything that continues to exist and fester today. And that goes all the way back to the transatlantic slave trade. It created all these reasons why uh, blacks are, are the race that we're going to enslave. And then you can see that come all the way here 400 years later and how, um, because it's sub zero, someone has to lose in order for me to win. Blacks have to lose in order for whites to win. And you were talking about your Irish ancestors. There's a great book. I think it's called How the Irish Became White. Because when they came here, they were actually considered lower. Immigrants were considered lower than blacks at that time. And that's a really good book I recommend. But uh, like when you see people at the, the taco stand or the sewer bar and all those stuff, and you see it all over YouTube and all these Karens and everything, that just run up and say, they like, black it out or whatever they're saying. It's because they are they are the the cog in this in this machine that is has systemic racism and uh, the racial hierarchy. They they're doing their role to continue uh, uh, distracting from the policies that are actually impacting black people probably the most. Um, and actually, it's way more costly uh, for a lot of these black people in urban areas. I live in D.C. still, and I'm actually up the street from Howard. Um, that it's a lot more costly for a lower class black person to, to, uh, to create a, a pathway to the middle class than it is a poor white person. And there's a lot of studies and statistics that show that. And, and also since uh, redlining, I think the median household income has been stagnant for, for black families. I think it's still around 13,000 when white families has gone up um, incrementally, exponentially. And, and so, that was caused by policies. And so maybe in lacrosse, maybe there's another way to look at this and say, hey, we think we're focused on the right things. Let's get kids in from low social economic backgrounds. Let's create a team. But also maybe this pan out and look at the bigger picture, like what is really preventing these kids from getting a chance and also to go on to college or however we measure success, why aren't they hitting these benchmarks and milestones? And we could use lacrosse as a vehicle to do that. But just like Harlem lacrosse is, I, I have two interns from Harlem lacrosse, amazing people. And, but I think it takes us to look at, to step, take a step back and say like, what is, who's really pulling the strings here? And what is really going on? Where is the funding going? Um, which schools are getting it? Which, school, which programs are, are receiving it? Why, why aren't they? And I think it's actually going to, like, I've tried to resist politics my entire life, but now I'm starting to really see, especially, you know, what we have going on right now, how really important it is. And uh, but so I think it comes, the racist ideas, the policies, the power, it's all chicken and egg. It doesn't matter which comes first. It's just that the cycle is still going and we need to figure out a way to break that. 
So thank you for starting that, Trevor. Mm -hmm. Can I can I say something on that part? Um, uh, I think when when um, Harry, you talk about stepping back and and not just looking at this as a lacrosse issue, but about kids succeeding. You know, I, I see that all the time because I, I teach at a Title I school um, and um, only 10% of our, our school population identifies as being white. So um, it's very mixed and we have nothing. I mean, our school literally has nothing. We, my school was built in the 1950s and the curtains that hang on our stage are from the 1950s. The blinds in our windows in my classroom are from the 1950s. Um, and so if, if, you, if you do step back from the lacrosse field and, and wonder why, why are these kids not succeeding more? Because they're not even getting like the most basic things. Um, and, and we're part of a school district that, um, that has money. And I have been to some of the other schools in my district that come from very wealthy neighborhoods. And I can tell you that it's not equitable because the parents in, in the public schools in, in the rich neighborhoods fundraise to pay for things out of their own pocket that their kids are not getting. So they don't have old lines in the windows in those schools in the wealthy area, and they don't have old stage curtains and they don't have beat up old desks in the classroom and they don't have water fountains that are probably 50 years old and they don't eat at lunch tables where the paint is literally peeling off them. And those are just physical things. It's not talking about even the quality of, of the books these kids get or, or how many kids are in a classroom. Our, our, our district designates that, you know, you can have 35 kids in a, in a fourth and fifth grade classroom, but in the, wealthier neighborhoods in my same school district, those parents pay out of pocket, so there are no classes with over 20 students. When you're educating a classroom of 35 kids as opposed to educating a classroom of 20 kids, there's a different education right there. And so that's a big problem. I don't know the history on it, but when we allow the public school system to be funded based on zip code, so based on the, the tax, the real estate taxes that people were paying, that's when we significantly contributed to the inequities in education. And so I think, Trevor, you you really hit up, you all have hit upon a really great point when you're talking, and Harry, you actually said this about digging it. Good job, former student. Thank digging you. into the systemic issues that then, because the lacrosse inequities is an outcome of a larger system. And I think, you know, residential segregation, redlining, all of those things contribute to the education that our students are getting today. But we don't necessarily peel things back and address those because to your point, Troy, that's the root cause. That's the, I mean, the root cause is racism because black and white people white people have not wanted to live where black people live and we've created legislation to support those self-interests which dr kendi talks about in this book how to be an anti-racist if you haven't read it i highly encourage you to read it highlight it's it have a book book. discussion about it yeah it's excellent that's a master's degree in african american studies in one book yeah. but and you were talking about like what we're seeing right now i don't know if anyone saw this but senator cotton what he came out and said and he said how race, uh, how slavery is necessary evil. And he's tried to make sure that uh, uh, 1619 project isn't being taught in schools. That's, that's what you're talking about, uh, Ms. Opie. You're talking about defending it, uh, racism, right? And defending their place. Because uh, God forbid people actually wise up and realize what's happening. Um, and so and that's when the uh, legislation and policies are enforced. Uh, and a lot of people aren't aware of it. You know, Matt, you, you opened up with uh, a question that I've been thinking about a lot, and which is when you are one of the only on the team mm -hmm. and, how, and how that makes you feel. And I can tell you, it's kind of weird to say this, but this is the truth. I don't think I ever felt more lonely 
when I was on that 90 U.S. national team. Oh. I, re I, I really, that was, and it wasn't because my teammates were trying to make me feel that way, but he, now here, here's, a, here's an experience, and I think a lot of guys in the 90 team probably never heard this story, but this is a true story. Yes, we, we get off the plane in Australia. We all have the same Trevor nose. We, we all have the same outfits on. Everywhere we go, we're wearing the exact same guard. We go through customs at the airport in Australia. So this is not just about U.S. racism. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, right? Go about systematic, go global, like global level. So we, we're going through custom, and I'm the last one to make it through customs. I get to the team bus, and my teammates go, yo, oh, where were you? I said, oh, I went through customs. What took you so long? I said, oh, they would throw my bags. And the guy said, I said, didn't they go through yours? I said, no. I'm the only one in the entourage they went through all my bags, check everything. I'm in the same outfit of everybody else on the team, but I'm the only, as my mother would say, the only fly in the buttermilk in that entourage. <laughs> you know, and no, like when they all heard I went through it, it wasn't like they said, oh, wow. They didn't say nothing, you know. They said absolutely nothing. I think that might have been the beginning of that experience of feeling alone, but I really felt on that trip by myself, I don't think that none of them ever had the experience of being the only one on their team. Mm -hmm. If they did, I didn't know about it. So, you know, that's a kind of weird, I mean, the, the, the epitome of our game is making that U.S. national team. And I think in my lacrosse career, that was the time I felt most lonely, which is a really ironic thing, but it's true. So I, I played at Australia on a, a program called World Class with the McGowan family. And they, and I, my experience in Australia was actually pretty, uh, pretty all right compared to in the U.S. And I don't, there might have been one incident there, but, and that was when I was 14, but I was on U19 and we played, we were playing at Towson and it was 03, but the kids came from all across the country, Texas, Long Island, Baltimore. Uh, all these different places and that's what that was my first real experience of like actually seeing the country without having to go anywhere because and then I'm like oh so this town is racist um, this these guys don't know anything they never see black people before uh, the first call we did was at the US uh, lacrosse hall of fame on Hopkins campus I don't know who we're calling or why we're on a conference call there <laughs> maybe we're talking to the president of US lacrosse Association. I don't know who we're talking to but the kid from Texas who went on to play at Ohio State, he, all of a sudden he just starts rapping nigga, 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 like stuff like that. And I'm the only black guy there. And so I, I feel that, that was one of the first times I felt paralyzed. My twin brother wasn't with me. My dad wasn't with me or anyone else that looked like me, any of my teammates that were black or had the same experiences. And I was just like, I froze. And, and it was talking about isolation. And then the whole time U19, like we won Worlds. The other goalie got hurt. I ended up playing the whole time. Like, this was like a story, like it was a story tale. I should have been celebrating uh, going out after, right after we beat Canada. We hopped in, in my parents' car, drove back to D.C. from Baltimore. Um, in the ACC championship, uh, my junior year, uh, we were playing UVA. Uh, an attackman uh, who coaches college right now called me nigger after I made a save. I, I cleared the ball, jacked him in the, in the throat, started tussling with him. The ref blows – uh, blows a whistle and they're like what's going on what's going on all the coaches are like and I'm like he called me nigger coach Cotto and my brother they go directly to Dom and, all, and the whole sideline start yelling at them like and talking to the refs uh, my other teammates they were kind of like like we we go right into halftime after this and they were like did he say that did he really say that because they because it's someone from Jersey and it's someone that they grew up playing with like oh my god I can't believe someone I know would say something like that Right after halftime, we come back on the field. The two other attackmen, and I'm sure Amy knows these guys too, they, they come up to me, and these are guys I grew up with. Um, they played the same high school conference as me, and they apologize because they know, they know even though the, the guy was denying it. And by the way, denial is the heartbeat of racism. If you're explaining, you're losing. And that's, that's, a, that's a flag, that's a signal and a warning 
whatever I see someone saying they're not racist. And it tells me that they probably are. And, and so he was denying it. And the two teammates came up and said, I'm sorry, Harry. They were the only ones that said that to me that day. I'm sorry, besides Coach Connell and my brother. And it told me a lot because those players know that he said it before. And they were apologizing for him being caught. And, and so that's, those are experiences of isolation, just two that I could think of, Mr. Obi. But I'm with you on that. And it's funny because I hear stuff about Chaz, about defensemen calling him nigger in college. And these are guys we played against the MOL. And, and so, like, and these are people that are scared right now. They don't want to be, they don't want to be got. And I, I just heard a story last week of repeated, into like blatant, repeated blatant incidents of racism at uh, a name school. A name school. Where make it play, make it play, and I don't want my children going to these schools. <laughs> uh, call them out now. Like, do you call these guys out now? We'll, like, we'll say Rutgers, but I, here's here's the thing. So I I've had I call them out now. I, I had it. I, I, the reason I didn't say it initially is because this was third party to me. Like I I heard it from somebody who was in a, in a in a conversation, um, and I've suggested because they. Kids already graduate. I already suggested they speak up and say it. Um, and I suggested they have that that guy come talk to me, and I'll tell them to speak up. But um, but that hasn't happened. But I, I mean, it's it's not uncommon. That's that's. I think I, I think that's the thing. It, it's too easy to to fall into this belief that these are isolated incidents. When in reality, if you ask around, it happens all over the place, all the time. I mean, we just had, I just posted something the other day, a, a kid, uh, it, it, something just happened in a game the other day with a high school kid. I mean, it's routinely. Well, there's, there's the incident was, that happened. Go back to Africa and go back to Wakanda. Yeah. <laughs> After yeah, that being was, that's, there. that's the incident that I'm referring to. Um, I got forwarded to me from Kyle Harrison today. We were yeah. messaging about that. I think that's the same one, Chaz. It, it is. I, I talked to that kid uh, I talked to him today. yesterday. I talked to him today. Yeah, man. Yeah. So that's a, that's, that was last weekend at a tournament, apparently. Um, it's past Sunday. Uh, yeah, last weekend. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's past oh, weekend. It's Sunday. May have been this. Was just this I think Sunday. it was just this Sunday, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's only Tuesday now. God, it's only Tuesday. Anyway. <laughs> well, you know, um, I think the thing that gets me, the Harry, as you mentioned, the thing that, that has made me go silent on people, some folks that like block their phone calls, people I've known for so long. Mm -hmm. If you're a teammate of mine, you know me. We 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 battle together through workouts, through games, and I tell you something happens, and you say, Really? That, that's what gets me. You're, you're my teammate. You're my coach. You've known me for 20 years, 30 years, two years, whatever it is. And you're questioning whether it actually happened. That to me is the problem. That, that's when I, you know, I kind of lose it then. I'm just, as I as say, if you just said it you, just to say it. Yeah, my, my wife would tell you, when, when I lose it, I get real quiet. I mean, I'm, I'm done with the conversation with you. <laughs> but and so I don't trip to watch because these are people who I know he has been really close to, and they'll be calling him. He's like, I'm not taking that call. And, and y'all, I mean, y'all knows. I mean, this is some of the royalty of lacrosse okay, wait, that I'm talking about. Okay. I ain't gonna put the name out there, but you can figure it out. Oh, oh no, we're not putting now. We're not calling people out. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's I'm how joking, you guys get out. This is perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I got you. Uh, hey, this is, Fred, uh, Fred can I ask you a question? Need some hints. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> Fred, you're gonna laugh at me because this is a this is a little bit of a, a what can white folk do, Mr. Douglas? Question. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 
that Dr. Tina told me not to ask on the last podcast. On the last podcast. No, but I'm, I'm curious, Fred, from your experience of feeling lonely on a team and, and, and me being a coach on teams where there's only one black player, it, it was, it, is there something a coach or teammates could do uh, to help be with you in, in that loneliness? Remember, Trevor, when we talk, when we, when I interviewed you for the podcast, I said, "What would you do if you saw one of your teammates limping during the game? You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ignore it. You have time, or even during the game, you come up, hey man, what's, you know, Trevor, what's wrong? What's going on? It's that's the thing. When you part of the problem is kind of what my wife was saying uh, to you, Kevin." that white folks don't want to talk. A lot of times they know exactly what just went down, but they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to censor their own people. So for me, it is, if you're a coach or a teammate, you need to come, you need to, come to my aid. I, I saw one of my former players from Gettysburg, who I haven't seen since 89 or 90, something like that. And one of the first stories he was shared is how when one of his teammates did one of the nigga nigga calls during the game, one of his white teammates. And he went after that dude with an abandon. And his coach said, you know, what's going on? What's going on? He said, you know what he called that kid? That's what should happen. If it's one of your teammates, I think it's the same thing with guys and gender. If you're a dude and you hear somebody being misogynistic, you need to call it out. If it's on your team or if it's somewhere on the other team, call it out, come to the aid of the person. Let them know you don't tolerate that. So if you see somebody being hurt by one of these very painful words, just come to come to me the same way if I had a, a look like a torn meniscus or something. It, it, that's that's good. I, I love that. And I would say the other day, you have to treat it like it's COVID nineteen, like but it's it's not it's not visible. You can't really see it, but you have to treat it as if if I don't take care of it now, it could spread to someone else, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but in calling people out, I've been doing something where I, I go into, I slide into DMs and I, and if I don't feel like it's the right place to do it publicly, I'll, I'll go to them on Instagram or on Twitter and I'll say, Hey, um, great job speaking out, but you need to clean up, clean up your own house first. And I'll send them a screenshot of him saying something misogynistic on Twitter or, or racist. And, and I get, I get the yes, sir. Cause I'm now old. And so and these are like current players like the best players, um, the ones with the most visibility. And so that's how I do it subtly sometimes. But in talking about feeling like isolated, the, most, the thing that's happening right now, which is POL and in the patches, have we talked about that? And then I feel like 90% are wearing them and 10% aren't, but the ones that aren't wearing the Black Lives Matter patches are the ones that are standing out the most to me. And I have have you guys thought about that or have you heard about that? Now, Jack, can I, I had a college coach from a very strong program, you know, perennial, you know, top whatever program, reach out to me because, you know, part of it is, you know, he really was struggling with that whole thing because he, you know, works with the PLL a lot. And he says, you know, when I got players that are on this team where it's it's – how it wasn't, he said, this player would tattoo everything on his arm about Black Lives Matter in terms of this is what I, this is what I like, but the symbol Black Lives Matter because of some things that were said in some organizations that were, you know, it's not just Black Lives Matter, but it's Black Lives Matter mean defund the police. Does it mean this, this, that? He said, I got police officers in my family. This is what he said, one of his white players. I got police officers in my family. I got law, I got a uh, military in my family. I got guys in my family that I don't want to, somehow have them construe me wearing a Black Lives Matter patch. It's his conflict, his personal conflict in his family. He said, he said, this kid's like, I know that Black Lives Matter, but I don't know what Black Lives Matter means. They're like, I know Black Lives Matter, but I don't know what BLM means. And if I'm putting that on there, then I'm accepting everything that it means, right? Which means that in some of my people, again, this is what, this is the conversation that I had with a coach because he was like, well, should the PLL put the patches on the shirts and give them a choice? Should they put it on the field? Should they put it here? Should they put it there? So that they can own it as an organization, but personally give people the freedom to do whatever they're doing. I mean, this was a long conversation, 
And that was the that was the rider. That was the thing that was where the line was in the sand. And so that that this is a good topic right here because when you they just said I'll do everything but mm -hmm. they stopped right there. And that's that's what you where you ended up with the choice because they were discussing that. Right? Everybody gonna wear them or not. The Black Lives Matter sign in my yard. One, I've received hate mail, and I don't want necessarily want people to know where I live. But I do think, sort of to Amy's earlier point, if everybody's doing it because it's been systematized, then I'm wondering if it's if people lose agency, what does that mean when they have it on? It means something different to me. And I, what I want to make sure is that people have choice and that it's not co-opted by an authority figure who's telling them that they have to do this or they cannot do that. I find that to be very problematic as a leader. Yeah, it's because it, it so, so, so it gets into authenticity. If I don't have choice, mm -hmm. then I don't have authenticity. So I would rather a person have the agency. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, similar things happen around our campus and it becomes you become suspect if you don't have xyz patch or sticker on your door you know and i i don't think that makes you an ally because you have a sticker on the door yeah you know, my biggest problem is going to say it, my biggest problem is with white liberals okay because you talk a lot of crap but when, when it comes time to actually put up possibly lose your job you know where to be found so I would rather you keep the sticker off your door, the patch or the shirt off, and just show up for me. That's what I would rather you do. And that's that's Massachusetts for you. Oh please, yeah, <laughs> Massachusetts is the site of the most virulent racism I have ever experienced, and I'm from the South. But this has been the place where people have gone to the police station to file a report on our then 11 year old son, based on fabrications, and thank God there were videos cameras to corroborate what he said. But I mean, I just want to give you an, a, a taste for what we're dealing with. But that's everywhere. That, that's, that is everywhere in this country. And I think to the earlier points that were raised, it really is incumbent upon white people at Thanksgiving dinner, at Christmas, when, the, when Uncle Joe says those things that are racist, Look, I'm not going to get access to him, but you all have them. And I, it, it must be in your families. You probably have those relatives who you're like, oh, gosh, I'm embarrassed for them to say anything. And you may want to avoid them. But if you avoid them, does that mean I have to deal with them later? I love messing with the Uncle Joe at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would, Amy. <laughs> I drive right into Uncle Joe. And here's the thing is sometimes I'm not like, I, I, you know, I get really nervous because like there's a lot of facts and there's a lot of numbers and there's a lot of like to back up your stories. And so like recently and like trying to fight my, my battles, um, which I don't like, I think a lot of people that I've been like arguing with and for and to have really started to like understand. And I've been really trying to put out information on my Instagram that is valuable that people need to see, um, that are facts. And so when I'm having these arguments, like I can back it up with evidence like nonstop. And, um, you know, some of like the, the harder conversations to have with, you know, my, my own dad, who is the guy who says, Oh, well, you know, I used to pick, pick this little colored boy up and I brought him to lacrosse practice. I was like, D stop. Okay. There's your first, your first mistake, dad. They're not called colored folks you know that right and like my dad is just the nicest dumb person like I and I hate to say that but like he's just so uneducated and he grew up in Garden City and he moved a block away from where he grew like he had he's barely even come to visit me in Baltimore and so like I I feel so sad for some of those people and it doesn't necessarily hurt my feelings because he's my dad like I I feel sorry for him he's always going to be my dad and I'm still gonna go at him hard as if he was just some man on the street. Because to me, like now this is my family. These are my kids. You know, I have three boys and like the fact that like, you know, one in three black men can go to jail. Well, then I'd have to pick either my husband or one of my sons. And like, I get really passionate and emotional about that because he just doesn't understand, you know? And this is like, these are my, this is my heart. This is my soul. These are my people. 
And um, I think those are the battles that are hard to fight. You know, they really are when people are just, they don't see it as, it doesn't apply to them. You know, and I've said to most of my friends, I'm like, well, you have three boys, your husband and your two sons, which one do you want to lock up? And they look at me, I'm like, pick one, pick one now. And I pressure and I pressure. And I think the hard thing is like, when you think of it in those terms, for me personally, it's like, I, I, I can't, I can't pick any of them. And I, and I would, I would go before them. And so I think I get so emotional about it. So sorry, <laughs> but like the passion and I, I feel like what I feel what I know you guys have been fighting this for years and I've just been doing this for months and I'm, and I'm exhausted, you know, like just for months of education and trying to like, you know, fight and trying to just inform you know, and I, and I can't even imagine a burden that like my husband had to carry being a black man, growing up in Philadelphia, going to school in Richmond, moving to Baltimore, like just all these things that he's had to endure. And I'm just, I, I feel fortunate enough to like have him to, to, to be able to like put me in my place when I need to be put in my place and educate me further when I need to be educated further. But, you know, it, it is hard when you come across the people that are just so dense and like, to me, that's a hard thing. Like my dad is just unfortunately very dense and nothing I can say will like turn his wheels. And I'm like, now I'm just running into cement, you know? And those are the battles that are really, really hard to fight. Um, you know, I'm, I'm willing to give information and help people and not judge people, but the people that are just so dense and like can't even see it, like those are the ones that are, are getting really, really tiresome. And I'm sure you guys have dealt with it over and over again. Um, and sorry to get like so upset over here, but like having three men in my family, like that's a hard thing for me. And Amy, Amy, thank you for sharing that. Um, appreciate that. I get yeah. it too. Sometimes I don't show what's behind my eyes. It's in there. And all I'm doing is planning, right? I'm trying to figure out how to use it. But here's one of the things I will share is like, you know, my wife is white and I, my kids, my, she didn't talk to her dad for two years when my son was born, right? She didn't talk for two years and um, after the second year, um, her sister had a son and her grand, and, and he said, I finally have a grandson. Now listen to me. This is my life. This is my child. Now I had to figure out what to do with that anger. Now, granted, I was living in Tennessee by that point. He's in Philadelphia. Now here's the interesting thing. This man's best friend is black now. This man has lost that other grandson because the other grandson tragically died. This man has seen my kids grow up and be wonderful people right before his eyes from afar, and he can't touch them because they are hurt. Now, part of it is that I would, she talks to her dad now, but even when she writes a, a check from, for his birthday, I said, who is that? Who can, where's that coming from? Is that the joint account or something you put on the side? Because I, you know, you know, I, I'm the one that, that, that's ready to keep the peace, but I know how to do something else too. And the challenge is I fight with myself and there's a lot of weathering internally sometimes when you fight against yourself because you want to set it off sometimes just to get feel better just for a second that somebody feels a little bit like you felt, right? And but 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 reason, logic, when you learn how to control your brain a little bit and don't go off or just on instincts and you go on what's rational, you try to figure out another way to to move things. But here's what I would say. You know, you it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the 20, 60, 20 rule again. And sometimes it might be somebody that you love dearly that you have to pause for a second because you're going to spend a lot of energy wearing yourself out. Like I could have worn myself out for 30 years, wait for this man to come to his senses. He wants to know my kids. I'm leaving it up to them now because I'm, I'm their dad, but I'm not their owner. They got a choice. He wants to know me. And even me, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of faith in my way. And I try to figure out forgiveness and grace and all this. But good gosh, that's a hard one. And I'm telling you right now, I've even woke up a couple of times and I talked to my wife about it. And I said, you know, something makes me want to just change this and just go ahead. This man is different now. And it took some things to change him. But time sometimes is the only thing you got. In the meantime, while you're waiting on that fool to, to, to evolve, work on the 60s. Right. And I'm saying that fool in terms of my, my father-in-law, not your father. You got to decide, you know, where he's at in, 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 the, in the ranking, in the spectrum there. But my point is, you say, Dad, I got to pause with you for a second because there's people I care about in my life. If you cared about me at all, 
then you would think about this a little bit differently. I need you to try, Dad. I love you, but I need you to try. And not in the moment when he just said the word, but in the moment when he's not saying a thing. Catch him when the stove is cool. Sometimes you get more things to talk about because they get, they get defensive right away when they're in the heat of battle because it's fight or flight for them too. And I got to be wrong or I got to be right. But sometimes I just got to be there. And so catching them when it's, when, it's, when it's no conflict and maybe you're walking and talking, Dad, you know something that's been on my mind I just want to share with you? I want you to try. Or do you love me enough to try? With whatever that is. And you know, you know what? Like, I don't want to put my dad in like this terrible light. He does try. Like, he's actually like a really like heartfelt guy. He just like, there is like a level of like density. And he's always, anytime my kids come around, he's always so great to be around them. He wants to be around them. He loves them. And he calls them the most beautiful kids. And like, he, what scares me is that the people that are around him and giving him information. And I'm like, dad, that's not correct. And so like, if I know that he's getting this negative information, like, what are other people getting and latching onto? And that's what like makes it seem so overwhelming of like, how do we even start to reach? And like, you know, if you're, um, you know, I think probably a lot of us on this call are like, have a little bit of perfectionism in us, um, especially like the athletes where we're like, we're going to do it until we hit the pipe 122 times. And if we didn't do it 120 times, we'll do it again. And so I think, like the perfectionist in me is like trying to reach all these people. And that is like a frustrating thing where you're trying to do all this good work. Um, but like, sometimes you're like, it falls upon deaf ears, you know? Um, and you, you really start to see like the, the lack of education. And that's like another big thing. And I, like, I kind of want to bring up education for, cause you guys are all in like the lower, uh, some of you guys are in the lower school education or the middle school. Like, you know, the people that write these textbooks and even like, what information is given to them. There's things that I'm learning about that I didn't even learn about. I didn't learn about in high school, going to Garden City High School. And I didn't even learn about at college. And I went to the University of Virginia, which is one of the best schools in the country, they say. Like, there's so many roadblocks to like knowledge that it's just, it's so unfortunate. And we, how do you even get around those roadblocks? How do, like, how do you perpetrate these, like, the, these learning lessons? Like, we, it's so much deeper and it's like how do you get to that where these textbooks now teach you about what Juneteenth is you know one of the um things you brought up Harry before about you said you said well I've never gotten into politics before but now I'm starting to and I think for a lot of athletes and coaches they're very uh, very hesitant to even show any any sort of politics with what they do a lot of times because um, we're all told to basically shut up and dribble you know and, and, and I've gotten this from other other coaches in the game I've gotten this from other other athletes in the game as if these idiot talking heads on these cable ch news channels have something better to say than us these people are idiot actors Mm -hmm. And we sit there in front of our TVs and say, no, it's okay for them to talk about politics, but I can't say anything. I think at some point, athletes and coaches got to realize they're going to they're gonna be making a, a political statement one way or the other. Politics are part of our, our lives. And, and I, I made this point the other day on Twitter around uh, this thing with, with the Iroquois not being allowed into the world games. And, you know, well, if any of these players think they don't want to get political and not, you know, maybe not boycott uh, these games if the Iroquois aren't allowed, I hate to tell them the IOC is one of the most political organizations in the world. <laughs> they are driven by politics. Putin uses the Olympics for nothing more than to build up uh, a Russian pride in his country. It's all, it's all politics. Um, so I, I, I just, you know, I, I hope we like support each other, even if we're, uh, there, there's so much complexity here. Like now we are told that if we wear a mask, we're, a, we're, we're some sort of liberal, we're some sort of crazy liberal wearing a mask. It's like, there's a pandemic going around. <laughs> I might wear a mask from now on. I, I, I'm staying healthy with a mask. Like yeah. if you want to call me a liberal for wearing a mask, fine. But, um, and, I, and I bring all this up to your point, Amy, is, um, one of the things I studied in my master's program was around adult development. And it's so, in, in my mind, it, it, it's not just knowledge, it's also 
we have these stages of development as adults where there are a lot of people out there that uh, over 40% uh, of our American population is, is stuck in what's called socialized mind. Uh, and there are people below that. Uh, and and there, <laughs> there are some people in very high places below that. But socialized mind is where you make meaning around your group. I'm Democrat, I'm Republican, I'm, uh, I'm conservative, I'm liberal, wh whatever it is. And then you kind of consolidate everything ar around uh, that being. And I, and I think that's what you see if guys, uh, to come back to your point, Harry, around, well, I don't want to wear Black Lives Matter because then that puts me in that group. And that's not, that's not who, I, who I am. And what we got to, and one of the great things about sports is that it helps usher more of a mission driven stage of development where you start to follow your own values, your own principles. Uh, you can still be part of the group, but you have this own driving force and mission in your life that isn't restricted by the, the group itself. Um, so just wanted to add that to all the great points you all are making. Love that. Thank you, Trevor. Love that. But it's funny just thinking as you're talking about politics in Oakland, the election for mayor was a Green Party versus Democrat. So it's a, um, um, such like a, uh, sometimes I have to leave the Bay Area bubble and be like, oh, wait, um, <laughs> and take that pause. <laughs> I think the other thing too, just, um, you know, you guys have to go. Is that what you we're going to be in bed in 10 minutes. I mean, we go to bed. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell y'all, that was the appointment. It was the pillow. Okay. Yeah. Um, my, my wife just texted me, what am I doing? She thinks I'm like on my Oculus right now. I'm like, I'm in the basement. Let me say, go ahead. Dad, I am shocked. You're a wide awake man. I would have been like, I don't sleep. I do not sleep. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, no, do you guys see you. Like, go ahead and say something before you leave. Just walk off like old angry man. You gotta do a mic drop. <laughs> yeah. You gotta say something, Opie. Okay? <laughs> I mean, look, obviously this was a fantastic conversation because we were supposed to get off an hour, an hour and 10 minutes ago. So I think that alone, I, I just hope that uh, what's shared, that people will understand our passion about what it comes from. And then, and that please wake up lacrosse community. But as, as, as Chaz has said, and so many people said, this stuff doesn't happen every once in a while. It's happening all the time. And we're bringing things to the, to the sport and we need to improve the sport. It is to create a sport and we need to start treat it that way. And if we don't lower the barriers to get into the sport, if we don't, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, here in Trevor, if we don't change the, the culture of the sport, it's going to be business as usual. And I don't think the majority culture in the sport understands how many people are hurting while we're in the sport. I love the game of lacrosse, but it's, it's something to be in college playing with a great team and great teammates. But when practice is over, when games is over, I'm going in a different direction because my culture doesn't feel valued or respected. And so if you want me to play the sport, but say, give up my culture to play it, that's going to be a problem. And there's, and, I mean, the, the Brown folks on this call, you all know this. Everybody tries so hard to be an insider in our sport. And some of us do it to the point of giving up our culture. And that's just not acceptable. That's not acceptable for Native American, for, for, for Latinx folks, for Asian folks. One should not have to give up their their culture to join the sport of lacrosse. That that's my message. I would close with. Tina, any last thoughts? Well, I would say so. As I mentioned, I I'm not from a lacrosse background, but what I say to people, if if to your listeners, if you love the sport of lacrosse, try not to get defensive about this because if we enact the change that we've discussed on this call your sport will get better. It will improve. You will have the best of the best. I'm going to say that if you have exclusion, you don't have the best people playing the sport. You all are athletes. You like to compete against the best. Make sure everyone has the opportunity to participate and you will be 
you'll know that you're competing against the best. And the other thing is, is I would like to really encourage the educational institutions out there, the nonprofits to think about how they can actually systematize the things that we've talked about. We have got to stop emphasizing the individual level of analysis and thinking that these players just need to try harder, get part-time jobs so they can afford it. And we have to look at the institutional level and say, what are the barriers at a systems level that are preventing people from being able to participate? And you have to become about the business of winning that equation. I like it. Well, thank you both. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Well, Kevin, next time. We'll do yeah, it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. I'll make sure I share on the. Did great. Did great job. Everybody did great. Amy, I'm worried about your daddy listening to this thing, though. I'm like, you didn't call the man. <laughs> In my family, Amy that was my right word. <laughs> Amy might need a new Thanksgiving spot. So, uh, oh, no, I'm like, girl, I'm like, we'll, keep, we'll keep four seats open for you. That will be out. <laughs> bye, everybody. Thanks. Good to see bye. you again, Chuck. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Okay, bye bye. And to the to the remainder of you, I would like to just go around the horn and let everybody, you know, riff a little, say a closing statement because I've taken a lot of your time. Um, but that was is definitely what I thought it would be would be one of the best episodes I, I felt like I sat in on because that's all I was doing is sitting here listening, um, and, and I appreciate everybody's time. So. Um, Whoever wants to start, uh, Chaz, you've probably been super busy today. So you, you, if you want to start and finish or whatever you want to. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, we, we touched on so many different things throughout this whole thing. Um, I think the one thing that I, I kind of landed on with the, with the last part of the discussion is just that, um, you know, we can't afford to turn a blind eye. We can't afford to pretend that, that there's nothing going on, particularly in this sport. Um, we can't pretend that, we, that we're not all a part of it in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and we all have a role to play. We all have a platform to use. Um, and we've got to be willing to speak up on it. Um, you know, just kind of like the patches, what you, what you don't say, says just as much as what you do say. Um, and, and so whether it's in your home, whether it's with your players, whether it's with your, you know, who, whoever happens to be family, um, you got to be willing to say something and, and to speak up and hold people accountable. Um, and in and, and a, a, a wide range of topics, it's not just racism, but um, we've all got to be a little bit better and we've, we've got to be willing, like I said, to hold other people accountable. And ourselves. Truth, truth. Um, uh, Harry, you probably got to get to bed at some point. You know, I know you have a little baby over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just want to say thank, thank you. And I don't even know how I ended up here tonight. <laughs> I, was I was stalking you. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think. Uh, I feel very uh, uh, appreciative just to be here with all you great people. And, and if we have a cross paths in person, like I've been a fan of yours or uh, we're somehow connected, like lacrosse is very network driven. And I have found that a lot of the people, especially the people that are, you know, have played at the highest levels, a lot of them are innately like entrepreneurial, they're outgoing um, and connectors. And so, I think that I think there's still a lot of work left to do, but I'm still really hopeful and optimistic that uh, we could all contribute positively to to what we want the future to look like in terms of lacrosse and how people treat each other. And so I, I think it starts with these types of convenings and uh, these. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying like a safe place, a safe space, uh, like a risk controlled environment where we could all just be able to feel comfortable saying whatever we're saying. It's not going to start comfortable, but I think there's different levels of growth um, that we could all 
uh, you know, move along. Uh, but it starts with these types of convenings and, uh, and then community and also the content. I think we would combine all of those three. Um, I think uh, a lot could be accomplished. So thank you, Matt, for putting this together. Thank you everyone else for, for showing up. Uh, as my mom always said when I was a little kid to me and my brother, uh, when we didn't want to go to school, she said, show it up is the hardest part. And that's something that's always stuck with me because if you show up, you can at least get a C. <laughs> and, uh, but I think that's stuck with me through, through a lot of things and, and I share that with people too. Because I think uh, if you show up, good things can happen and you never know. So thank you guys. Yeah. Um, I proof that you don't get a C for showing up. <laughs> I, had, I had to earn my C. <laughs> By the way, Harry, Harry, you don't remember me, but you were a freshman at St. Albans. Yes, McCallie. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I remember you because I was like, wait a minute, Black Goldie, what's up? <laughs> you know what I'm that was a, yeah, you know, I was, I mean, it's just, you know how it goes. I, I mean, I, so it was fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade. I chose Goldie because no one else wanted to play it. And maybe that's how Trevor started too. But, and I knew I could be on the field the whole time. I didn't know, like, I was setting a new trend or standing out by being the black goalie on the, on the field. But uh, I definitely remember playing you guys. And I love watching your son play, too. And so thank you for everything that you've contributed to the game. So that's awesome. Thanks, Trevor. Christina, do you want to share a last thought? Um, well, I'm going to bounce. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Good night, Harry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you, Matthew, for organizing this because it, it is really important for people to come together and talk. And, and I think we need to have more of these, not just focused on the lacrosse community. In, in every community, just people being brave enough to get together and just talk. So thank you to all of you. It was definitely, it's, it's, it's good to hear everyone else. So thank you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, uh, Kevin. Um, yeah, first, thank you, Matt. Um, thank you to everybody on this call. Just feel like uh, learned a ton and, and feel um, appreciative to be in this space. Um, I think third, I will come on to something tomorrow that will sound a lot smarter. So I'm going to do my best here to like uh, round it up. But I think um, just really trying one, uh, as I'm here in the Bay Area, to, to like systematically really approach it that way. And that's from like our league and putting people um, that get it and understand it, like on the, our league board, getting into referee training, like it's got to be on all levels. Um, and it's got to be with like multiple prongs of people and, you know, get the 20%, like it can't, it's got to get that 20% that already converted to work on the 60%. Um, and we've got to make that move. Um, and then just, um, I think what's come out, our kids in Oakland lacrosse every year, as many of you shared, have just experienced racism on the field. And, and then when we bring it up to the other team, like our kids wouldn't do that. And, and so it's just, relentlessly advocating in my role in my position as a white white person leading this organization is relentlessly advocate for our kids and our young people and our families uh and uh, to know that we're going to create a safe space for them in oakland lacrosse but that safe spaces need to be no matter what field they're going on um so that's where i'm at with this and, and thanks again for being letting me be a part of this thank you for being here. Somebody had a question no. amy you want to some closing thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, this was super intimidating. When you read me the roll call, I was like, uh, don't sign me up for this, maybe next time. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very passionate as you guys can see, this is how I, how I coach and how I live my daily life. And I think it's really important um, for, for college students, um, especially in this, this time um, where, you know, politics where people don't want to be involved in it. And, you know, me as a coach, I've definitely been shamed for giving my opinion here or there. Um, but I think it's really important that kids that are of college age listen to this know that they have a voice and that what they say and what they do and what they say and don't do 
um, is also really powerful and important. And so I think my voice would be to a lot of college students or about to be college students and really just like when you get into your college environment, really educate yourself as to what's going on and formulate your own opinions and not your opinions based off of like either where you grew up or what someone told you. Um, and I think that's really important for a lot of these um, kids going into college that they're going to be bombarded with a lot of different things. And, you know, I, I would hope that they can choose their, their own route and their own words through their own education and um, educating themselves a little bit further. So, um, you know, they all have a platform and I just would really like to see a lot of college kids use that platform to move the needle um, and create a more inclusive environment for, um, for black lacrosse players to have a home here at the sport of lacrosse. I, I just remember, Chaz, what you had um, back when you were in the previous episode, you were talking about your experience at Brown, um, how you had, you would, it was like you were telling a story about going out socially to like a black fraternity party or maybe it was something of that nature, and how you had wished, it, how much different it would have been for you had some of your white teammates been like, hey, we want to come with you, you know, and just, just to learn. Uh, what's going on in, you know, quote unquote, your world. Um, and, and that's something that I, mean, I, I agree with what you're saying there, that students should, uh, I'm not a world traveler, but I'm lucky enough to knock on wood, keep traveling. And I think going to places, um, learning different cultures, and Trevor, to your point, cultural awareness is like, it's just keeps going up and up and, it, and it's it's just it's something that you know not every kid can do obviously but you can seek a different person uh and christina you do this all the time seek out a different person just in a lunchroom setting in in uh, uh you know in your youth team or whatever it is like i think dr fred said you know if somebody's limping go over and talk to him or her you know um you can find people in your community that are different from you you just have to look you just can't sit there and you know think everything's one way or the other now i i'm trevor and troy i kind of want you guys to close together because i know you guys are orators so <sighs> trevor i'll let you go first we'll go i don't know beauty before age or something like that or age before <laughs> uh, no Tro troy's voice is much better than mine i i i, I want to close with troy's voice <laughs> um <laughs> First of all, I just wanted to say congratulations to Chaz. Uh, really excited for you at Hampton. If there's anything I can do to support you, I think you're going to do you. great, great things there. And you know, one thing we didn't talk about today was we, we need more black coaches in the game. Um, and, and so, I think that that's a, a great step for the for the game having you down there. And I wanted to say to Harry before he got off, I got two of the greatest phrases from Harry tonight of culture, each strategy, and showing up as the hardest part. I'm going I'm to use those as a coach all the time now. Those are in my back pocket. So thanks, Harry. Um, now, I, every time I do these conversations, I, I learn something new, just, just uh, like Christina was saying, from, from listening to other people, hearing different perspectives, hearing from some of the experiences like uh, Harry and Dr. Fred and Chaz shared tonight and, and, and Troy as well. Um, and so I think sometimes people want these conversations to be like groundbreaking and all of a sudden things are solved and it's like, it's just one little step at a time. And, and I, I would jump on these calls, you know, if we didn't record them, we didn't post them online, I think, these type of conversations in our communities are, are the most important part. So um, this is our lacrosse community. This is what we all care about. Um, and, and Amy, I've been really impressed with your passion. And, and I know uh, I've been around that college coaching world my entire life. I know, I know how hard it is to uh, come out and, and be a, uh, and stand out in, in that world. And so it, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, for you to do what you're doing. And like I said before, Kevin, I, I'm deeply appreciative of guys like you building the game from the base up. So uh, Matt, thank you inclu for including me with all these great people and uh, look forward to more of this. Um, uh, Troy, just, just can you bring us home? 
I'm gonna try, man. I've been working on my wind up here. Um, <laughs> but, but here's what I would say. First of all, thank you all for participating. I'm glad I had a chance to get on the call. Um, I was on another uh, IG live thing right before this. And, you know, it's interesting where, you know, at, there was a point in my life where I didn't think I mattered to anybody. And now because of things that you do, you can matter to everybody. And what, what that means is the platform that you have, you got a lot of power in your platform. And that's what I love about technology because you can scale up. Everybody in the world can watch this if they really wanted to, right? So we said something, we said something real tonight. We shared some things, we were vulnerable in this space. But here's what I'll say. My message is really to the coaches out there because coaches, coaches create culture, right? And like you said, coach eats strategy for breakfast? Absolutely. And when you're, if you want to sh- solve the problem, again, it's a root cause piece. So we got to take it up north. And I don't mean north in the country, but where, this, where, the, where the source of the water is, right? And part of this is if coaches are as intentional about creating the kind of culture and climate on their teams as, as they are in terms of running plays and creating wins and, and, and on the field and things will be fine at the end of the day we got to be intentional we have to be informed and we have to be courageous and a great friend told me the other day when you get to those crucibles of leadership where you got to make a choice where you may lose something the stakes are high you got to say you got to be courageous and this is what his definition of courage was was awesome courage is the control of of fear so that one can carry out their duties no matter what happens. Mic drop. We got to be courageous. That's it. And that means the white folks talking to the white folks, the black folks talking to black folks, all that, because somebody's got to move it. And and if the 20% don't want to listen, they're going to step aside because we're going to keep on moving because the nation is changing anyway, right in front of their eyes. So remember, they're responding out of fear. And when you're scared you're not rational and a lot of people when they're afraid they're not rational so understanding that so the bottom line is this folks um i really appreciate having the opportunity to be there i really appreciate listening to y'all sharing things because i'm learning as well and um you know i'm proud to be a part and honored to be a part of this kind of conversation so thank you matt well again i i i can't i can't thank you all enough for for just for being you you know, you, you're all, I'm no genius. So I just get lucky putting these together. And this, I feel like was like a two hour special that PBS should be airing for Christ's sakes. Cause you, you guys really, really had me just in awe. So, uh, you know, I can't wait till COVID's over and I can travel and be on like the Eastern seaboard or Northern Cal or back in Denver and just like all like, Hey, we're meeting together, go down to a Hampton game in the spring or something. and, and, and actually be cheering on the coach, not the players, you know. Uh, and UMBC game two, Amy, I got you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just, I just want to say, I hope everyone listening and watching uh, enjoyed this. And to you panelists, I'll make sure you have the link and you can share it, obviously. We have to turn this around pretty quick um, tonight, tomorrow, but we'll get it out to you and then we'll air. Uh, everybody watching this is actually watching Wednesday night at 8, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, and I think we'll run it for the two hours, but we'll have to check with Lux, All Stars, and Lux Coach Matt and see if they break it up or whatever. But uh, again, thank you, panelists, uh, for sharing. And I think, I think it was you, Troy, that just said, you know, this is just a small step uh, in the process. And, and I'm just thankful to have you guys willing to, to all be on and, and be honest and open. So I appreciate it. And, I've got a, I picked up one, Trevor. Wait until the stove is not hot. What was it? Wait, wait until the, the pot is not hot. Is that, that it, Troy? That's it. Yeah, you got to have a conversation when there's no conflict, right? Wait till the stove cools down, man. Wait, you just, wait till the stove cools cool down. I like have that. a conversation when it's cool. When it's hot, nobody's rational. Fire yeah. That's yeah. If, you, if you really want to show, just let Troy talk and just let him get all this. I'm telling you. <laughs> You will have line after line after line after line. In fact, in fact, at the end of all these, you should just take Troyism, just lines and just string them together in one show. Yeah, as you know, I met him. We played. We got placed on a team together. Where were we in? Um, Denver. 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 Yeah, for the World Festival game. And yeah, you you were in line. You, you can run that mouth, man. I'm telling you, <laughs> straight Troy lines. 
ten thousand hours, like five minutes, of, said, man. five minutes of lines of Troy. Lines of Troy. So with that, we'll go ahead and and, and thank everybody, and uh, I appreciate you guys and girls, and 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 let's wish everybody the best of luck and the best of the rest of the week. And uh, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of this. And, I'll be calling you back because, you know, it's always good to circle back because it's something new every other week, unfortunately. So have a blessed rest of your week, and thank you, and uh, I'll be in touch. Take care. Yep. 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 And everybody. We had a couple of late panelists join us, and I want to make sure they're properly introduced. First, we have Harry Alford III. Congratulations to you on the latest addition to your family, Harry. He was originally born in Indiana and raised in DC. Harry is a two-time All-American at the University of Maryland and a former professional lacrosse player. Professor Alford holds a BA from the University of Maryland, an MA in Sports Industry Management from Georgetown University, and an MBA from Babson College. Harry is the co-founder of venture development firm Humble Ventures where he accelerates the growth of startups in partnership with large enterprises and investors. Also joining us was Chaz Woodson, who returns for a second time on Overtime. Chaz is a 2005 graduate of Brown University with a degree in education studies focused on human development. He then earned his master's in coaching and athletic administration from Concordia University, Irvine. Chaz was recently named the new head coach at Hampton University, and he also serves as the coaching director for Nation United Lacrosse Club. And last but not least that joined us was Sir Troy Kemp. Troy didn't begin playing until the age of 21 after he graduated from Colgate University. He was a coach in Tennessee for eight seasons, or, or 12 seasons, excuse me, with eight Tennessee State Championships and three Coach of the Year honors. His passion for the game has landed him in his current position as Director of Recruiting for Nation United Lacrosse Club. Troy is also the Executive Director of the National Center for Development of Boys and also an Administrator at the Rock Clark Academy. Post a question to the panel by emailing us at ot at emwf.org. We'd love to hear from you.